Thanks for listening to this teaching from City of Life Church. Check out www.col.tv for more great teachings, service times, and information on upcoming events. Now, let's join the service already in progress. So welcome, welcome to City of Life today. Welcome those of you that are watching online. Today's a special day because uh, you're here, you're, you're watching. I think that makes it special. So I, I hope that God prepares you right now to just get touched in what, whatever you're going through. And, and likewise, for people in this room, I think God gave me a message and a word today for you. And I've been praying about this and I, it's just something that was in my heart and I wanted to share it for a while. And I feel like that this is the right moment to do it. Um, I'm just going to read this scripture and just jump right in. Psalm chapter 23, verses one through six says, the Lord is my shepherd. Can somebody say amen today? I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to talk to you today about a message that is called, It's Okay. It's okay. Look at someone next to you and say, It's okay. Amen. Father, thank you for your presence and your goodness here today. Let your word just come to life. Lord, we're not here to listen to a talk. Uh, We're not here to listen to a person in particular. We're here to hear the eternal words of life that come from the word of God. And we believe that preaching God is something that is used by you and ordained by you to communicate those eternal truth, truths through a person in a supernatural way that when we receive them and we hear it, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So let our faith be stirred up today when we hear your word spoken in truth. And we thank you for what you're going to do here today. Let lives be changed and people be drawn to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, um, for those of you that have not heard about a little bit about my family's journey since January, when we found out on January 10th that our son Jude had Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, it, it was not something that our, our family was expecting in any way. Uh, we knew there was something going on with Jude's health, but it's just not something that was really on our radar of imagining. You know, you, you, you don't really ever write yourself out of the possibility of something happening to you that you don't understand or you know, that it's negative or something like that. Everyone can, it can happen to anybody, you know, but you definitely, it's not something that, that I was feeling was about to happen or something like that. And so it was a big change. And, and, and I think that the, one of the first things I want to do before I get into my message, it, it's connected with my message, but I want to say, I think something that was very hard for us is just not expecting this and having the doctors tell us what they told us about Jude Uh, And being in that room when the doctors were communicating to him the seriousness of what of the kind of cancer he had, the stage that that cancer was uh, at at that particular time and coming up with a treatment plan. The first thing that he the doctor said to Jude when he told us about it and explained it, he said, now, I want to let you know, I understand you're a senior in high school. He said, but just just make sure you get this straight and understand that you will not graduate. He said, you're just going to have to do away with any ideas like that. You're not going to graduate. You won't go to your graduation and you will not go to your prom. He said, toward the later parts of the year, you're going to start feeling better. But just so you're not thinking this is just like an inconvenience that you got to go a couple times and be all right. This is the level of what you have and how it's going to affect your plans. So, um. That was in January. I just got a, something I want to show you on the screen here. That was Friday night. That was Friday night. And by the way, the previous Friday, he went to prom. My boy. So I'm so thankful for a God that is able to do 
exceedingly and abundantly far more than we can ask or think. We, we were, you know, honestly, we were okay with that understanding that it's part of the process. It's not like we were, and not even Jude said, That's, this is not fair. I can't go to my, pro-. none of that stuff. But God has just been faithful and graceful through this, this whole thing. So I haven't had a real chance to talk about, I guess I've had a chance, but just never taken the chance uh, to really talk in a narrative form about like my personal experience with all this and how I felt. I don't, I'm not even going to do that today, but I will kind of go back through a couple of quick things that, that happened because it, it relates. It, my message is based around what something that happened uh, to me. So I think that when you are dealing with information that is just so outside of what you're used to, uh, big information like that, that you're just sort of hearing people, but not quite understand, like, like you kind of, I mean, you understand what they're saying, but it's not really, uh, you don't really get it so much. You're like, this is not, this can't be happening. Uh, when, when you're doing that, there's a lot of things, a lot of ways that you can process that level of, of suffering. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the different worldviews um, and how different philosophies deal with suffering in just a moment. But first, I'm going to tell you uh, something that happened to me and like the way that I was going through some of this stuff. Well, so, so for me, we were there in the hospital, I think, was it 12 straight days? 14 straight days um, from, from the time that we found out about this. And I think the first Sunday I did not come to church but just because it was just, it was, uh, it was just nuts. I, I did miss that Sunday. But the following Sunday... Um, I preached and, and I came to church on that day. And I remember I had been up in the family room at Nemours Clinic Hospital. They have a, a room that's like got two big windows where you can look out and see, uh, you know, Lake Nona. And it's real beautiful at nighttime. You see the Wave Hotel and all that stuff. And that room is empty many times. Where you can just go in there and think and contemplate. And I'd just been trying to figure out, like, how does my faith fit in all of this? Like, how does... You know, everything I've declared and spoken and like who I am as a, a father and a husband and a pastor. And how, how is all that? And I'm thinking about all this stuff and trying to, uh, you know, make some kind of peace and get through th- those days. How many people know that when it comes to miracles, I think there are macro miracles that are huge miracles that we see them and we go, that's obviously a miracle from God. But I think sometimes when you're in the middle of a crisis, a micro miracle might be being able to get out of bed. Uh, or being able to just have lunch and, and, and laugh a little bit at something somebody said. And, I, and God gave us a lot of those miracles through that process. But I came to church uh, that Sunday, and I remember, you know, just standing up on, on stage or s- sitting there on the front row while these guys are on stage worshiping and just weeping uh, because the, the lyrics just meant something different. Uh, you know that phrase hits different. <laughs> uh, the, the the lyrics just felt different to me at that moment, uh, and everything that was said. It's kind of like remember when you were young and like you broke up with somebody, and like you would be like driving around and you would hear the radio, and the radio would be like, "Every time I think of you, <laughs> I always catch my breath. I ain't missing you at all." And you're like, "Oh, they wrote this about me." <laughs> I'm not missing you. I mean, you just think every song, every song is like a love song. Every song. And like you just, the way you listen to music is different because of what you've been through in the same way. I think for me, you know, that worship was just taking on a different form. And I, I was just taking every word in and I was crying. I was, it was just kind of in this moment. And I was sort of in this moment where I was trying to let God know that I truly, no matter what happens in my life, that I trust him. And I was trying in my own way just, just to say something that showed him where my heart was, knowing um, what we were facing. And I just said, I said, God, I said, it's going to be okay. And I just was saying it in faith. It's going to be okay. It was a faith statement. And I felt the voice of the Lord just move in me in that moment. And he said, it is okay. He said, it is okay. Now, when, we, when you hear that, 
you may think that's just kind of semantics. It's going to be okay. It's okay. But that couldn't be further from the truth. What I realized is that it's going to be okay is based on an idea that a specific set of circumstances must take place in order for me to realize that it's okay. So I'm, I'm going to dig into that. I think that there's a fork in the road in our faith. One road of it's going to be okay leads to a destination. And at least that's a different view than it's not okay and it's not going to be okay. We're, we're just eliminating those, right? Because as Christians, we know that, you know, we, we, we typically believe one of those two things. It's going to be okay or hopefully what the Lord spoke to me, that it's okay. So I want to kind of see how that fork in the road affects us here today. I want to talk about some different uh, worldviews, some different philosophies uh, when it comes to different religions or, or even a secular view. And I want to talk about suffering for just a second because we don't think about this a lot. We just go through things. And we never put any thought into how we're going to deal with it. And some of us are dealing with suffering through philosophical ideas that are borrowed from ungodly sources. And we're processing suffering in a way that belongs to another religion. Or we're processing suffering in a way that belongs to a non-religion or a secular worldview. So in order to do that, let's just kind of look at the five major religions for just a second. When you look at Hinduism and Buddhism, you're looking at the two karmic religions that believe we come back in life and are born multiple times. And then you have the three major you know, monotheistic religions, meaning it's the belief in one God. And similarly, you know, Islam, Judaism and Christianity all believe in the story of Abraham, uh, scripture in terms of meaning one God. Certainly, I'm not equating the Quran with the Bible, but I'm saying that they do believe in similar stories from a story standpoint. So those three uh, religions have a similar worldview when dealing with suffering, meaning that they believe that there is a sovereign God and ultimately it's up to him. So we're not really going to spend too much time differentiating Islam, Judaism, and Christianity on how they process suffering. They do process them very differently. And Christianity is far superior in the way that we process them compared to those two things. But that's not my point. My point is to make a distinction between the two karmic religions being Hinduism. So let's look for just a moment at Hinduism. In Hinduism, the thought, pro and, and I'm, we're talking, you know, a billion people in the world, you know, over a billion people in the world that, that follow this, this, this worldview in this philosophy. Philosophy, you know, when you think about the word philosophy, you think of the study of or the love of something, uh, phila, and then Sophia, meaning wisdom. So really, it's just the study of wisdom. So there are different thought processes that people have. So in Hinduism, when you think about that, the way they think about suffering, here's the way they deal with suffering in a general sense. Since Hinduism is based so much on your actions and what you do, they believe that your actions and what you actually do in life, the decisions you make, are the determining factor in the suffering that you will experience in the next life. So in Hinduism, it's all about what you do. So if you are constantly cutting people off on I-4 <laughs> and leaving the toilet seat up, <laughs> then in the next life, you're going to be a Gators fan or, or you, you know, you're probably going to have cats or something like that. It's just like it's just bad things are going to happen to you in the next life. You're going to have roaches in your house. You're going to have you know, so. So so the idea is that whatever negative things that we do in Hinduism, that the, the things that you do create the suffering in the life that you are. So the, the life that you're currently experiencing, the way these uh, th these thoughts are, are kind of prevalent in culture is whatever suffering you're experiencing now, you're responsible for, for what you did in a prior life. So you can't complain about it. You, you have to accept it. So the way they process, if someone dies in their life, their thought is, well, then I must have done something in a prior life that earned this. So what that philosophy leads to 
is an attitude of resignation. So rather, and just acceptance of all suffering. So any suffering that you experience, your response to it is resignation. That is a way that some people, even Christians, will, pro- will process suffering. They'll just throw their hands up there and say, I can't do anything about it, whatever. And that's kind of borrowing that philosophy. So over into, then we look, you know, kind of like at Buddhism. And with Buddhism, it's not as much about what you simply do as much as it is the intent behind it. So in, in Buddhism, it's the intent behind what you do, and they believe that suffering, according to the four noble truths, uh, and, and the, four number, the four noble truths are something like, you know, suffering exists, they know that suffering exists, and I think when the Buddha was kind of looking through life, he, was, he saw four different kinds of men, he saw a sick man, an old man, a dead man, or a hurting man, or something like that, and when he started processing all this, he came up with these four noble truths, and what he realized is that suffering is all around us, so Buddhism is really built on the idea of suffering, and suffering exists, I think is the first one, the second one is like suffering is caused by desire. So eliminate the desire, the third one, and you can eliminate the suffering, and you eliminate, and the fourth one is you eliminate the desire through the eightfold path. And I think that eightfold path, according to Buddhism, is something like, you know, do the right thing, say the right thing, speak the right thing, all, all these kind of things that lead you to dealing with your own desire and eliminating desire and to break that down, what that basically means is quit loving stuff. You don't want to hurt from losing a family member, then don't love the family member. So it it doesn't mean don't love them, but don't have the desire for that. Eliminate the need for anyone else in your life. Be self-sufficient. Eliminate the desire for stuff. Then if you don't get that stuff, you won't be disappointed. Some Christians even do that. They don't want to want the promotion. They think if I want the promotion to, are you following me here? You see how we do this? We can borrow these ideas when it comes to suffering and we set ourselves up for non-disappointment by not even wanting, not even desiring the thing. So, so according to this philosophy, we see that with Hinduism, it leads to resignation and with Buddhism, it sort of leads to a detachment. We detach our emotions from the things that we want. So in the case of someone that gets a negative report, you just have to figure out a way to emotionally detach yourself from what you're going through, then it doesn't hurt you. But these things don't work. And they're, it's not the way that we were created to be. Then you move over, I guess in that sort of world, and this is not a major world religion, but I think another major way of approaching suffering from a philosophical standpoint would be kind of like the, the shaman warrior culture or the Greek Stoics, which believed that showing emotion is um, a neg- it's a weakness and that for your family or for your tribe or your culture, that if you have honor, you take that upon yourself and you show absolutely no emotion. And that's the way of bringing honor to your family uh, and, and to you is to not let negative things affect you and to push forward. I think many of us had fathers like that or grandfathers like that or great grand. Does anyone here have a father or a grandfather that maybe never even said, I love you, never even showed emotion because they were, that's sort of part of that older culture were very stoic in their mentality. So that leads to stoicism. And stoicism is just not, it's pretending you don't have emotions. So here's where these things lead so far. It leads to uh, detachment, to resignation, or stoicism. This is not the life that I want. I don't know about you. Then we have a secular culture that's not even a godly culture at all. And I think that the secular culture is the culture that I think is the most disingenuous because they say there's no God. They say that the universe is accidental, which really is implying that there's no such thing as objective moral truth. There's no absolute right. There's no absolute wrong. But yet they're always saying you're wrong. You're wrong. It's funny. They're telling everybody who's wrong, but there's no basis for what's wrong except what they think. Right. But yet. And then I also hear people that say, you know, you know, I, you know, my dad passed away several years ago, but I just, he's just, I, I know he's looking down on me right now. Well, from where? 
if, if there's nothing and there's no one, why aren't you repeating what you said before? My dad is gone and dead and he never, it never even mattered that he was alive. No one says that. Why? Because they don't really believe that. It's just what they say. So I think that that particular worldview leads to dealing with suffering. And and you can tell that the world, the secular world, doesn't understand how to process suffering. Because when you see a tragedy, people go nuts. They're asking, why, 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 why would this happen? If there was a God, why would he allow this? And they get so mad and so angry. And so I just kind of added this at the last minute, but I do want to address this. So if we see that Hinduism kind of leads to resignation, Buddhism uh, leads to detachment, that that warrior culture leads to kind of a stoic mentality. I think that modern culture also leads to the way they process suffering is they want to find somebody to blame. Is that when something negative happens, our current culture, and I believe that it is developing a culture of victimhood. And what a culture of victimhood needs is it needs to blame somebody for every suffering that occurs. So if something happened, rather than figure out a healthy way to process it, people want to relate with the victimization. And what I believe that it encourages, actually, through that whole process, is not the elimination suffering, but the welcoming and addition of more and more suffering. Because in order to find your personal identity, you have to be identified as a victim. So it produces blame, and that's the way that some people deal with suffering. Even Christians do this. And Christians can do this even with sickness. They can blame their family for the, for the or they can blame their family for the, historically for the, their health. They can blame them for attitudes they had or things they did. They can blame, if something bad happens, they can blame the government. They can blame a political party. They can blame, and we kind of get into this whole thing where that's the way we process suffering. If I can just find someone to be angry at, then I'll be okay. But I want to tell you today that as Christians, the Bible offers a far different philosophy on how to deal with suffering. Do you know what the Bible leads us to? Trust. That is far different than anything that we have discussed. And when I look at this radically different view of processing suffering, and and I see Psalm 23. I see the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What other religion has something that can even come close to that? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me down the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Why is this different? Why can we have trust as believers when other people have resignation, other people have detachment, other people have stoicism, other people have blame. That's the only way they can deal with their trials and their problems in this world. Why can we trust? And I think the answer is pretty simple. Because the Lord is my shepherd. That's the answer. That's why. That's why it's okay. It's not okay because I resign to the outcome. It's not okay because I've detached and learned how to deal with my own desires. Therefore, I've eliminated suffering. It's not okay because I'm a tough guy and I don't show weakness. It's not okay just because I've got a list of reasons why you're to blame for my problem. It's okay and I can trust because I have a shepherd. There's a big difference in that. I, I'm okay because I've got a shepherd. And to be led by a good shepherd, a good shepherd gives you confidence. When you know that you've got a good shepherd, that's why I loved growing up in church with my dad. Because my dad is a good shepherd. 
And I knew no matter what happened that my, my dad was praying for our church. My dad was praying for me, that my dad was faithful. My dad was reliable. My dad was trustworthy that spiritually when he spoke something over me or over my family, or over my church, he wasn't doing it for his personal agenda, but he was a good shepherd. And I also knew that if there was a question that I couldn't answer in the back of my head, I wasn't worried about it. I'll just say, well, I'll just ask my dad because he's a good shepherd. You know that he, whatever I didn't understand how to do in the back of my mind, I would say, well, I don't even need to find the answer for it. If I ever need that answer, I got a good shepherd. I'll just let the good shepherd let me know what it is. That's what it feels like to have a good shepherd. And, you know, just a couple of days ago, two days ago, Pastor Tim Keller uh, from Redeemer in a Presbyterian church in um, New York City, he passed away. Uh, He died of cancer and uh, Pastor Keller for me was one of the most influential voices in my life uh, other than my dad in terms of just the, he was really kind of like a modern day C.S. Lewis. But when I heard him speak, I heard that authenticity. I heard that trustworthiness of what it is to have a good shepherd. And see, Jesus says of himself in John 10, 11 through 15, I am the good shepherd. I'm trying to tell you today why it's okay. I want to tell you the difference between it's going to be okay, which infers that if you can work out your problems in a way that's satisfactory to you, then you'll be okay. Or if God can do a miracle that's big enough for you to recognize that you'll be okay. But the difference here is that Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He's not a hired hand, he says in verses 12 and 13. In verse 14, he says, he says, because hired hands just do it for the money. Then verse 14, he says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. They know me just as the father knows me. And I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep. He's not just the shepherd. The Bible also calls him the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth. He was the lamb which is a like kind of us as sheep. And he died the death that we should have died and paid the penalty for all the other sheep that would put their faith in the shepherd. So he has the right to say that he's both. He's the sheep that became our shepherd. And so I want to give you some reasons why it's okay today. Look at someone next to you and say, it's okay today. Today for you, it's okay today. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. I think, I think there's some people in here that need to hear this today. I said, it's okay today. That means that whatever it is that you're facing, whatever has been taken from you, whatever has hurt you, Whatever you've been through, you don't have to get to a certain place where you can get a smile on your face. It's okay today. Does anybody believe that? I don't think this section believes it. So I'm going to go over here real quick. That section, I don't think they believe it. I'll come back to you. I'll give you a chance. I'll give you a chance. Is there anybody over here that believes it's okay today? It's okay today. This is one of those messages that you got to hear it and you got to get it in your spirit. Why is it okay? Because you've got a shepherd. And in case you didn't really think of it, how the Bible talks about it, when it says that the Lord is my shepherd, y'all okay over there? I hurt, I hurt your feelings. <laughs> let me come back and let me make sure everyone's good because I like you. I like yeah. you. Does anyone believe over here that it's, going, it's okay today? Oh, oh, shoot. Yo. That section's lit right there. Okay. I'm just going to stand over here for a second. Okay. I like this. You ever thought about this before? That when it says the Lord is my shepherd, you know that passage that says he leads me? And, and, And that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear because you're with me. Have you ever thought about that in the context that if he's the shepherd and you're going through the valley, he must have led you through that path. 
Sometimes we think about that in terms of like, we've gone off and run away and we're in the valley of the shadow of death because of some bad decision. No, if he is your shepherd, that means he chose the path that he was going to lead you through. And no matter how devastating it seems to you, God knew that you were going to go through it. Yet he kept going forward in that direction and he is still with you. And it's okay today because he is still with you. He is still with you. He is leading me. So it's okay, number one, because I have a shepherd. It's okay, number two, because he is leading me. And I got news for you. It says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am going through the valley. And because he is with me and he is moving forward and he is walking and leading and showing and I am following, I know that he has an ultimate destination in mind and it's not the valley. I love Isaiah 43. I'm just going to say this prophetically over you today. Do not fear. Verse, verses one through three. For I have redeemed you. Who, who needs a prophecy over you today? Is anyone here that needs a prophecy for your spirit today? If you're watching online, just raise your hand. Here we go. Here's a prophecy for you today. This is pro- Put your hand on your heart and say, I received this prophecy. Here we go. We're going to prophesy right now in Jesus name. He says, for do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have summoned it. Only say you want to receive this prophecy. If you're going to walk in it, let it just get all over you right now. If you let it get all over, you're going to feel it. Here we go. Verse two, he says, when you pass through the waters, I said, when you pass through the waters, you're not going to get stuck in the waters. When you're in a flood, it's scary. We have people who lost their homes in the recent flood. And that's the waters. But it's saying you ain't going to live there. You're going to pass through it. You're in a tough situation where when you look around, everything seems spoiled. Everything seems ruined. But this is saying when, not if, but when. You're going to go through suffering. You say, well, I don't receive that. Then you don't believe the Bible. It says when. You pass through the waters. I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. They will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. You will walk through it and you will not be burned. Come on, look at somebody and say, you will walk through it and you will not be burned. I will walk through this fire and I will not be burned. Why? Because I've got a shepherd that is leading me. It's part of the path. If he led me through the fire and he walks through it, That means I am going to come out the other side unscathed. It reminds me that story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego when King Nebuchadnezzar said, if they won't bow, if you don't bow, I'm going to heat that furnace up. I'm going to throw all three of you in it. And they still wouldn't bow. He said, heat it up even more. They heated it up so much that the guy that was heating it up died. I mean, that's hot. If you can't even get near it without dying. And he said, throw them jokers in. And I love what he said. When he looked in there, chapter three of Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men? I thought we threw three men in there. And they said, certainly your majesty. He said, well, then how come I see four? And one of them looks like the son of God. Why? Because my shepherd. My shepherd will not leave me. My shepherd will not forsake me. My shepherd is walking through it and he's going to take me through it to the other side. Peter.
Peter says in 1 Peter 4, my friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. How could words sound more modern? <laughs> he said, man, stop acting like what you're going through is weird. It happens. That's the nice way to say it, right? It happens. Things happen to people no matter what it is. And he's saying, it's not, it shouldn't be surprising. He says, but rejoice. And as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Ultimately, guys, it's all about the glory of God anyways. When we walk through difficulty and trials and we don't give up, it gives him the glory. It's really hard to give him glory when things are working out for you. It's not impossible. It's just really tough. That's why when the Bible says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven, it doesn't mean that a rich man can't enter heaven. It's just saying it's difficult. Why? Because when you have access to stuff, you can make arrangements, you can make deals, you can sidestep God for a while, you can have faux success all over the place. You can do it for a while, but it, it'll run out of effectiveness eventually. And see, you can get through life for a while with resignation. You can get through life for a while with detachment. You can get through life for a while with blame. You can get through life for a while with stoicism. But you can't live a full life without learning how to trust your shepherd. And that's where we're kind of landing today. I think that it's okay because you have a shepherd too. It's okay because he's leading me. You know, and, and for those that are here today, you say, well, you don't understand what I've lost. I, I probably don't because everyone has such different stories. And I do have compassion for what you've lost, but You'll never realize that Jesus is all you need until he's all that you have. What does that mean? It means that there, there are times in life where it's necessary for us to lose something because it's the only way that we can ever get down in our faith to a place where Jesus is all we have. I've been there. I, I mean, in some ways more recently than you can imagine, but you know, years ago, 13, 14 years ago, I got to a place in my life where something I was experiencing with my family as well caused me to come to a place where I was just sitting in this dark closet trying to figure out what I actually know in life. And what I came back to is I don't have anything else other than Jesus. I have nothing. There's nothing that is appealing. There's nothing that works. I've tried other things. I've tried versions of them. They don't work. Jesus is my only hope. So I think number three, the reason it's okay is that he is my peace. And to kind of close, I'm not, you know, exegetically breaking down Psalm 23, but I think there's some things that are in here that are really powerful about why it's okay today. And one of them is thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Can I just mention really quick, Sometimes our incorrect image of the staff is that that's one thing. A rod and a staff are two different things. Do you know what a rod looks like? It looks like a billy club. It's like a tiny little, you ever seen those, uh, what are those officers called in England? They, they walk around with a little, uh, I don't know, those little, I just think of those little English officers, those little, little clubs that they have. That's what it's like really, but it's like a, a crude version of that for beating up animals or anything that tries to threaten the sheep. It's a weapon of war that your shepherd carries around with him. So what does that mean? Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That when I look at you, my shepherd, you are my peace because your rod represents power 
and authority. I can't solve these things on my own. I don't have the power to solve them. I can pray about them. I can cry over them, but I don't have the power. I don't have the authority to solve them. And the reason why it's okay today is because your shepherd has a rod and a staff and a staff, just so you know, it's pretty tall. In many cases, taller than the shepherd. So the sheep learn how to recognize the staff. Even when they can't see the shepherd, they can see the staff. That's why his name is Jehovah Nisi, which means I am your banner. You can see a flag or a banner coming on the other side of the hill before you can ever see the people that are carrying it. Why? When we look at the Lord and we look at his staff, it gives me comfort to remember the power and the authority that are under that staff and under that flag. Somebody say out loud, you have the power, Lord. Come on, say you have the authority, Lord to change my situation. Does anybody believe that today? Amen. I find comfort in your power, your authority, your salvation. So, he's the shepherd and following him is enough and it's okay today. Which means it's okay to ask questions. If God were small enough to be understood, he wouldn't be big enough to be worshiped. So it's okay for you to ask questions. You know, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your thoughts far superior to mine and your ways far superior to mine. He's just bigger than us. And it's okay for us to have questions to God. Take them to God. Take them to God. That's where people make the mistake, is not taking these things to God first. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to cry. It's okay to cry to people that you trust, but you gotta cry to God. We have to go to God with our hurts. Men, I wanna tell you that being a man is tough. It is hard to feel the, the responsibility of being strong for our families, but there has to be a balance, men, of being strong and learning how to deal with things privately with God and personally with God and having the kind of strength that comes from knowing who we are in Christ. You can be vulnerable with your emotions when you have strength in Christ that's rooted and grounded in Christ. I can show emotion to my family because I've been with the Father in my personal time. And I know what God has spoken to me. So men, I encourage you. It's okay to cry to God. It's okay to have doubts. You say, what pastor would say that? Well, one that's just trying to be honest with you is, I mean, you know, the disciples said, help me with my unbelief. That means that even the disciples that became the apostles dealt with struggles in their faith. Jesus called them many times, you, you of what? Little faith. They didn't have a lot of faith. So we're in pretty good company if the apostles struggled with this <laughs> and we struggle with it too. It's okay to have doubts as long as we say that to the Lord, help me with my unbelief. Help me with these things that I'm struggling with. I'm having a tough time with this, Lord. Take it to God. Can someone say amen today? You know, that's why God gave Job and David a commendation about the way they dealt with their struggles. And I'm going to tell you straight up, if you read the book of Job and you read certain Psalms, they're all but cussing God out. It's not nice. The stuff they're saying, they're like, are you deaf? Can you not hear me? You don't listen to anything. You don't care about me. You've abandoned me. You've left me alone. Why? Why am I the one that's in trouble? I'm the one that's being hunted. I'm the one that's being lied about. Yet I've devoted my entire life to you? Really? You're gonna let other people that don't even know you have success and look like what has favor on my life when I thought this was their heart. And God did not correct them for it. Why? They weren't saying those things on Facebook Live rants. They were saying it to God. And God was like, come on, get it all out. You see where it's gonna come back to.
And I think where it comes back to, the longer you say it, you finally come back to the place and, where you go, and why me, and why me? And then you go, but yet you've loved me. Why me? Well, in that, okay, well, that's, that's a good point, God. Why should you love me? There's actually nothing that great about me. And then he, he goes, see, I'm, I'm helping you work it out because you're talking to the right guy here. See, but we got to take those things to God. When you take them to your friends first, you say, why? I don't understand. I've done everything right. See, that's the wrong place. Take them to God. And, and just because I don't want to go too far over time, I want to say it's okay to smile. It's okay to smile. Not smiling means that you probably have gone down the road of it's going to be okay. And you're waiting for something to happen. You're waiting for something to happen that switches your mentality. And I got news for you, that thing probably won't happen. Because I think a lot of times when we wait for things and we don't understand how to celebrate the power of who the Lord is now, let's remember that story about the man that says he's gonna fill up his barns, he's gonna do all these incredible things. And the Lord said, you're a fool, you don't even know, you're gonna to die tomorrow. You're, you're building up all this, you're, you have all these future plans about the way things are gonna work out. You need to understand the power of now. For those people that are going through life, unwilling to smile, unwilling to be happy, unwilling to praise, unwilling to celebrate, because you think that something's gonna happen, it's really not honoring to God of who he is in your life today. Learn how to be happy. Learn how to praise in the midst of your storm. It's okay. Okay. These things I just mentioned, they're okay. Not because it's going to be okay, but because it's okay. I hope this message has connected with you today. I hope you feel encouraged in your situation that you're going through. I don't want to always make, you know, I don't want people to ever feel like if I'm going through something that what you're going through is not important it's so important to God and it doesn't even you can't even diminish the level of what is important you may have failed a test or uh, been disappointed in an outcome maybe you're an athlete and you lost a game and you're very disappointed and then you say well how could I ever compare that to someone that lost a loved one or whatever I just think that it's important to know that in your heart what is important to you is important to God and this message should be able to speak to those things that that may seem small compared to something else, but are not small to God. It's important for you in your life to understand the power of the way God wants you to live today. No matter how big or how small the problem is, it's okay because we have that shepherd that's with us. So if you could bow your heads and close your eyes today, I just, I hope there's encouragement and life in this room. Those people that are watching online, I wanna let you know that Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He gave his life for you so you could have everlasting life and so you could know this hope today. You don't have to live a life of resignation when it comes to suffering. You don't have to live a life of detachment, of stoicism, of blame. You can live a life of trusting your shepherd through the storms. It can start today, but first you must know Jesus. And I think there's two ideas there. I think there are people that know Jesus, but have yet to begin to live that way. And I pray in Jesus name right now that you would step into that new life. Not of it's going to be okay, but it's okay. I think that's a road people need to go down today. But there's some people that don't know Jesus. And this is a plea for them to put their faith in Jesus. And if you're here in this room or watching online, when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to put your hand in the air on three high up in the air and that's going to mean i need jesus to be my lord and savior i'm turning my life over to god i don't want to live for myself any longer so would you do that when i count to three on three all over this room and online put your hand in the air also type in the chat i'm lifting my hand i need jesus in my life and we will be able to connect with you here we go one the bible says now is the time of salvation two i believe every person here today it's here because God wanted you here. He purposed and destined for you to hear this message and be in this moment so you could respond to him. Three hands in the air if that's you all over the room. That is just hands all over the room in every single section, every single section. So, so many people lifting your hands. I believe people are lifting their hands online. I'm gonna pray for you right now. I'm gonna ask you to repeat this prayer with me and I believe lives are gonna change. Say it out loud. Say, I ask you.
you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins, to come into my life. I open the door of my heart to you, Lord, and invite you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. The old man is done with. The new me begins now. In the name of Jesus, let me walk in a life that is pleasing to you. Let me follow you because you're my shepherd. I'll follow you through the valleys. I'll follow you to the mountaintops, beside the still waters, wherever you lead me. I will have peace in my life. Thank you for dying for me and raising again so I could have eternal life. It begins today in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, could we give God a great praise today? Amen. I'll leave you with these final words. It's okay. This concludes the teaching. If you'd like to support what God is doing here at City of Life, click on the Give button at www.col.tv or text a dollar amount to the number 855-997-6900. We hope you'll join us again.